throughout. But if it hadn't been for the railroad, we wouldn't be here tonight celebrating the Alpha 125 years. Yes. And if the tracks had been built two and a half miles west of here, Oxford would be celebrating its birthday. <laughs> you know, the history of Alpha wouldn't be complete without saying something about Oxford, which was founded in 1837 by settlers. So how big a place was Oxford? Well, there were a few dwellings, a general store, a church, Baptist, and a bank and a private home were all built there. Incidentally, there was a bogus bank, one of several wildcat banks that had sprung up in various parts of the country during that period. Its sole purpose was to build the unsuspecting of their savings. They even printed their own money. Little Oxford never quite recovered from that blow. Oxford had another blow, a legal one. When in 1869, a railroad was built from Gallup to New Boston, and in 1871, from Rock Island to St. Louis. At this intersection of two railroads in the 1870s, a village is destined, destined to grow. A village off that intersection is destined to die. Oxford is abandoned, and a new town comes into existence. Anson Calkins left his home in New York in 1839 and journeyed to Chicago. Because business was poor, he bought a covered wagon and traveled Oxford Township in Henry County, where he became the first settler on the present site of the village of Alpha, which he planted June 6, 1872, 125 years ago. He bought the land for a dollar and a quarter per acre. The town was first named Ansonville in honor of Mr. Calkins, the first resident here. <clears throat> that seemed like a logical name for the town. But then he went to a church meeting where the minister read from the Bible, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Well, Mr. Crawford was smitten with these uh, lines since the town was the first in this locality and he had high hopes it would become a big city. He named it Alpha, which is, of course, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Tonight we have with us Anson Crawford's great, great granddaughter, Mary Shepherd whose grandmother was Mamie Calkins Peterson, <coughs> Anson's granddaughter. Mary's son is with her, so they are the fourth and fifth generation descendants of Anson Calkins, the founder of Alpha. Incidentally, Anson Calkins and his wife were buried at Old Oxford Cemetery. He died in 1995. <laughs> Anson Calkins had invested heavily in land <clears throat> and, pardon, and eventually owned more than 1,000 acres. He gave a railroad company the right of way and a site for the depot on part of his acreage. No train, no alpha. On another part of the land he owned, he established the first ever green nursery in the territory. In the 1890s, he sold 40 acres to George Wood on the condition that the land be continued as a nursery. George Wirt's children were Harold Wickiewirt and Mabel Wirt, who married Jake Rutledge. <clears throat> Tonight we have George Wirt's great-grandson, George, and great-great-grandson, Philip Wirt, with us. <laughs> also, George Wirt's great-grandson, Mark Rutledge and great-great-granddaughter, Abby Rutledge, are with us. The nursery has been maintained over the years. <clears throat> in fact, they have the centennial plaque, which is awarded the family that has been in agricultural pursuit for 100 years or more. The greenhouse, family-owned, was started in 1925 primarily to propagate plants. Not too many businesses as stable as the nursery and greenhouse. I wonder how many folks here work for work to run it. Raise your hand. Did you know that Mabel Work Raleigh was a nurse in World War I? Actually, I think she was probably a physical therapist, but uh, that's supposed to be a nurse. And sometime later, when she was in San Francisco, she joined the American Legion. Now that was a long time ago, Leo. It certainly was. 
Since the train tracks parallel Wurtz and Rutledge's, they have listed thousands of train whistles. Remember when you could go to Gillsburg on the morning train and come home in the evening on the 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock train? In 1908, Alfred Eicher and Jesse Cass went to Galesburg in the early morning train, got married there, spent the day sightseeing in Galesburg, then came home on the evening train. They were met by friends who covered them with rice and good wishes. Thank you. That 9 o'clock train was special. It was our curfew bell, especially in the summer when we kids were outdoors playing. We knew it was time to go home, and we always wished it would be running a little late. It generally did. I remember Dick Haywood pushing his mail cart to and from the depot delivering the U.S. mail. You can mail letters at the depot to go out on the 9 o'clock train. During the war, Oh, excuse me. <laughs> During the war, I heard there were some troop trains that passed through Alpha. Yes, and you know, I remember when Barry Goldwater was running for president, and he was traveling the country by train. We knew he was going to stop at Alpha briefly, so there was a sizable group of citizens, mostly Republicans, I might add, there to see him. He came out on the platform and waved, but no speech, but I remember him. He was the best looking guy I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't win the presence, but he was here good looking. <laughs> and the dolly. Who can forget the dolly? How got his name is debatable. Many think it was named after Dolly Gardner, the circus performer. It came into being in 1870 and was discontinued in 1952, lacking just three weeks of being 83 years old. This was another of the branch or short line halls of the CB and Q that is finally given in to paved roads, automobiles, and buses. In the last two days of her existence, the Dolly had probably hauled more passengers than she had in her last two years. Everybody wanted to get the last ride on the Dolly. I missed it. Yes. <laughs> now, not only was Alpha the beginning of a new town, but it was a new beginning and a new life for many people, thanks to the coal mines. Raymond White came from Iowa around 1920, and a vein of coal was prospected by him. The mine was opened by Charlie Schuler with the aid of Mr. White. It was known as the Schuler Mine until 1940. The main shaft and air shaft went down 265 feet to the coal vein, where coal production began on a limited basis in 1921. Did you know the Schuler mine was the safest, one of the safest at least, in this country? And this vein extended almost to the Harold Scotland farm. Coal production steadily increased by 1925 to 26, eventually requiring 200 miners. Where'd these miners come from? Some came from Iowa, but originally these miners came from other countries. England, Wales, Scotland, Sweden, Ireland, Italy, Yugoslavia, France, and Czechoslovakia. Some of the early miners were Patterson, Lucas, France, Palovich, Adams, Petrovich, Raisbeck, Mahalovich, Smith, McDowell, Wimpy, Castanoli, Carlson, Perry, Gullicks, and Johns. And later came Moreland, Gould, Lubin, Taylor, Hughes, Johnson, Dutrell, Stevens, Nimrick, Murphy, Lambert, Willis, Lundquist, just to name a few. And I believe the friends have lived here longer than any other. Tonight we have descendants of many of these miners with us. First, second, and even third generation. I read that some men hired on as miners, took the ride to the bottom of the mine, looked around a little, only to return 
top side and quit. The miners had to take an exam and have a paper to say they passed before they were allowed to work on the bottom. The miners had to furnish their own equipment. The early miners wore soft hats with carbide lamps attached for light. They didn't like these because they were always bumping their heads. Later came the car, hard hats with a light that were run by a battery attached to a belt around their waist. These have drawbacks too, for when they bent over, they often pinched their stomachs. One of the first jobs to be done in the morning was to go down with a safety lamp to see if there was gas in the tunnels. And I always thought they put canaries down there because that was not right. If it was too dusty, they spread lime on the floor to keep the dust down. They worked their own little rooms underground. They were paid according to how much coal they could pick in a day. About two or three dollars. We should explain, Leo, that about that it is not like picking apples from a tree. The miners used a pick to knock the coal loose from the wall. Wayne McDowell in 1933 made four dollars and fifty cents a day. And in 1965, when the mine closed, he was earning $33 per day. Well, since the mine shut down in the summer, didn't the men have to find other work to support their families? Yes. Wayne McDowell became the first lifeguard at the lake. Red Boogus and Oscar France often dug tile by hand when not working in the mines. Mahalovich's had milk cows, and others worked for farmers. In July 1940, I'll wait till the miners sit down. <laughs> July 1940, with the economy improving due to the war in Europe, John Lucas and Raymond White leased the mine from Charlie Schuler for five years. The partnership also included Charles Schuler Jr., a member of the original company. <coughs> they mechanized the mine at a cost of $500,000. Before this, ponies and mules were used. It was thought to be the most modern mine in the U.S. It also was the oldest and deepest in this section of the country. Leo, even though safety measures were observed all the time, there were accidents and some died. Unfortunately, yes. In 1957, the Bogus White Coal Company was dissolved. The Schuler Coal Company took over the mine and operated until the mine closed permanently, March 19, 1965. The mine equipment was dismantled and the shaft opening sealed, leaving only the surface structure and old smoky, the mine refuge down remaining. Let's listen to a little bit of old smoky. On top of old smoky. In 1965, Stoker coal was $6 a ton, and in 1976, it was $72 a ton. Quite a change. People were burning gas, so there was not the request for so much coal. We might add that there had been two other mines in this area. We had the Slope Mine, northeast of town. This mine wasn't in operation too many years. It had water problems. And two, Dale Johnson, along with partners, opened the Hazel Mine, Hazel Dale Mine, southwest of town. This was in operation for a number of years. There's still quite a bit of coal left in that vein. The coal mine south of town was in operation for 43 years. Leo, I know that the oldest person to work in that mine was your father, Joe Raisbeck. Yes, he started working in the mines in Cable, Illinois at the age of 13. He came to Alpha in 1925. He worked until he was 73 and the mine closed. He often said he and the mine tied. They both wore out at the same time. He was a timberman, setting props to shore up the roof. That was his way of taking care of his boys. 
You and your brother Joe surely knew what a hard life your dad had working in that mine. And I know you were very proud of his work, helping to make the mine a safe place for others to work. Alpha's business district has remained about the same size for as long as I can remember. It is sort of like a mini strip mall. In 1916, a grocery store owned by R.H. Willett burned to the ground. They thought the shoe store owned by Charles Clayton would burn too. And R.L. Jones had his grocery and dry goods store at this time. You could buy all your groceries from one side of the store, and on the other side, buy shoes and all your clothes. And then Flea Hardy's. <clears throat> Rachel and Bob Flea Hardy opened their store in 1935. We're lucky to have Rachel with us tonight. And remember George Kelly's barber shop? Leo, did George ever drop his upper teeth while cutting your hair? I should say he did. Scared me after that. <laughs> Butch Manneke, Burt Morgan, Clarence Mason all had mar markets for a while. Tony's Plumbing and Feeding, Ralph and Dorothy Blumen opened a drugstore. Today we have a flower shop, laundromat, video store, law office, and insurance and veterinary office. And remember, Basil Jordan sold TVs and went to about everybody in town. And Lumen Station, that was seemingly a permanent fixture. Yes, yeah, some of the boys always stopped there on their way to school. Now why? <laughs> it's now Bill's garage, and then there's Amy's station. Well, it's not Amy's anymore, sorry, Jiffy's and station and convenience store, and the grocery store, and of course the pharmacy. My, we are lucky to have these businesses. We've been fortunate to have had a bank in our small town. Farmers Bank was organized and began business May 8, 1909. Two days later, bank robbers blew out the safe and made away with $2,200. And in 1923, a tolling church bell, which Butch Knox heard, incidentally, thwarted the robbing of the Farmer State Bank at 3 a.m. when five gangs became alarmed after firing four charges of nitroglycerin in an attempt to crack the safe in the bank. They dashed out of town in an auto. I can't imagine dashing too fast in 1923, but that's, that's what the paper said. That was the second safe cracking job in Alpha in a month. Someone had broken into the Alpha General store and sold, stole $75. And in 1930, two bandits held up the Farmer State Bank and escaped after locking three persons in a vault. <laughs> Good heavens, what did they do? Well, Toons Clark worked at the post office across the street. She saw the cash. Can you imagine Toodles looking out the window? <laughs> She saw the cashier, J.E. Anderson, hand the robbers the money from the safe. She thought it was peculiar, so she wrote down the license number of the man in the car. Good thinking. Mm -hmm. When the robbers came out, Toodles ran to the Alpha Hardware Store next door and sounded and the and a total sounded an alarm. But the bandits escaped with three thousand dollars. Did they catch him? No, no effort was made to catch the bandits. <laughs> what about the employees locked in the vault? Well, Gus Anderson next door was a blacksmith. He knocked the combination from the vault lock and released the employees. Whew. I bet it was interesting to hear Toodles tell of that experience. <laughs> Speaking of experiences at the bank, did you ever hear what happened one day when Charlie Conte was a head cashier? No, but that had to be in the early 40s. Well, a gentleman came to the bank to talk some business with Tommy, so they were in his <coughs> office. This gentleman had brought his little son with him. Now, as Tommy and the gentleman were uh, engrossed in their business discussion, the little lad opened the drawer of Tommy's desk, pulled out a loaded pistol, and before the two men could move, the lad fired the gun, just missing Tommy's head. <laughs> now, a hole in the wall by his desk was a reminder of how close he came to that day. And that hole was in the, the wall.
wall bank until they remodel that place. Speaking of the Lina of Toodles Park, who we all recognize by our laugh, she, Marge Payton, and Anna Panovich were familiar faces at the bank for many years. Come on, Anna. Exhibits provided by the Chase National Bank in New York. Number one was a check signed by Henry Ford for one cent. Two, a check for $25,000 awarded to Lindbergh for his flight to Paris. Three, was the largest check ever cleared by that bank for the amount of $225 million for war bonds purchased by an insurance company. Oscar Wynn was the next cashier of the bank, and since 1973, Leon Robinson has been president of the bank. There have been many changes, many additions to the banking facility. Train. Again, oh, excuse me, Leo. Sorry. Again, the railroad played an important part in providing a recreational area for us. I wonder how many young people know that the cb q Railroad purchased from Ira Frankenberger 52 acres of land surrounding Shinch Creek for the purpose of establishing a reservoir. Now water was pumped from the lake to the railroad at one half mile away. I always wondered why they had to do that. Well, they had a well by the depot, but the water was so hard it was unsuitable for the engines. It would froth <laughs> and foam and form calcium and thus stall the engines. And it is interesting to note, Leo, and the rest of you men, that an Irish woman was a contractor for excavating the lake area and building the dam and spillway. No women swim then? No women In 1906, a charter group of 13 developed a private club for the present lake. By 1925, there were 800 members. There was a sandy beach, water wheel, diving boards, bathhouse, plus a clubhouse. I bet you didn't know there was once a barge used for crossing the lake with the picnic grounds. A barge? Good grief, the Crescent Lake. Yes. <laughs> it was like a ferry. It was 12 feet square and was attached to an overhead cable. A person turned a wheel by hand, which moved the ferry along. It was in operation for many years. Now, my first memory of the lake was the Tuesday night movies. Oh, the free movies. A thousand to fifteen hundred people congregated in the hillside to watch what I guess were first-run movies. And most of the kids would walk to the lake. Afterward, they could hop into Jordan Bland's truck for a ride home. He always had it parked in the same place, and the kids knew he'd give them a lift home. Families went on picnics there. Most all the kids learned to swim at the lake. Wayne McDowell was the first lifeguard. Susan Jane Perry was the first lady lifeguard in 1943. Many of the men were off the war. In the winter, kids went ice skating and sledding. That sled looked good tonight. <laughs> Those were the good old days. Okay. In 1940, reports were given that the lake had its most successful season. It was estimated that 2,000 people came to the grounds each week in June, July, and August. Membership was around 500. 
This was attributed to the low membership fee, which attracted people from a radius of 150 miles. I remember when old Dave Patterson was slide gun. He would head toward the lake in his Model T Ford. By the time he got there, he had kids hanging all over his car. And we have our heroes at Crest Lake, no matter if they want to be called heroes or not. Now here comes Leroy Willett. About 11 years of age, Leroy literally got in over his head. And George Beck saved Leroy from drowning. George was presented a trophy for his heroism. Another man from Dale Ashcroft. Except for a brief 
time. Alpha has always had an eating establishment. Oh. There was Cedar Bird's Restaurant, the Floral Inn, operated by Mamie Peterson, Harding's Restaurant, McKee Diner, Bork's Diner, and now the Alpha Restaurant. When we had bus service through town, it stopped at Bork's Diner to pick up passengers if there was a red flag out front. The three social places in Alpha were the Lake, the Skating Ring, and the McKee Diner. I think the diner must have been the forerunner of McDonald's. Zip and Liz and sister first ran it in 1940. Originally it was Boomin State by Boomin Station, but they moved it across the street in 1941. If I remember correctly, a lot of the school kids used to go there for a hamburger or tenderloin at noon. Yes, you remember there was no cafeteria at the high school. Three or four high school students used to work at noon to pay for their lunch. It was the place to go after the football or basketball games. It was the place to go after skating, too. There was standing room only. The juice box was going full blast. It was bedroom, but exciting. Yes, and there were no problems. Parents knew that their kids were safe there. Before the interstate, it was the only restaurant open late at night between Quad Cities and Peoria. I wish we could roll the clock back now and my grandchildren could enjoy their father's diner like I can't even know. Well, maybe they can start one. They look just like a miniature zip. <laughs> Sunday nights. Yes, and Saturday afternoon the ring was open to the low tops. <clears throat> it was so much fun to watch those little ones struggling to stay on their feet. The big kids came from Woodhall, New Windsor, Biola, and everybody learned to skate. Remember on the summer night when all the windows were open? From a mile away you could hear High calling, Oh, skate! <laughs> and the winter they had some dances there. I think the Pleasant Valley boys crazy the evening. Eventually, Gene and Spike, and then Gene, took over the ring and kept things just as high as Grace had it. Remember this song?
After skating, everybody went to Zip's diner. Whatever happened to the skating rink? A jean eventually sold it to another party. Unfortunately, one night it burned, and no one ever replaced it. You know, Alfred has been lucky to have had a, a doctor here. There was a Dr. Daniels. I think he died in 1913. There was a Dr. Shear. In 1936, Dr. Rothert came from Mississippi. He rented two rooms in Chinman's Barber Shop. And nurses. Did you know that Minnie Cox was a nurse in the Spanish-American War? She graduated from nursing school at Cottage Hospital in 1897. She cared for patients ill with typhoid fever in World War I, and even did some volunteer nursing in World War II. And then there was Agnet Jones and Mrs. Holmes, Ruth Mason. They were just some of the nurses. There were a lot more than that. And then there was Dorothy Boobin. She and Dr. Card were a real medical team. Dr. Card served Alpha. Thank you, Dr. Kihingo. This is a miracle. I know Dr. Carr wanted to say 
say something that... <laughs> now we also have a chiropractor in Alpha, have had one for many years. Carrie Wells, and Dr. Irene Nelson, and of course Macy, who massages the keeps out of your body, and then their daughter Elaine, and now her husband Bob Mejia, who has an office here. The first school building was built in 1858, a one-room frame building. The district was number six and was known as the Center School because it was in the center of Oxford Township. In the early 70s, it began to grow rapidly, and in 1877, the student body was divided and the lower grades were put in the upper story of a dwelling house in the village. In 1881, the schoolhouse was enlarged and rearranged to accommodate the whole school. And in 1884, it was voted to build a new building. This is the building which was moved uptown in the house of Masonic Hall. I don't know if you knew that, but I didn't know that until I read this in the paper. When the first school building was discarded to make way for the first mentioned one, it was sold to the modern woodman and Odd Fellows Lodge for $53.91. In 1895, the first commencement was held. The class had 11 members, but the class of 19, 19, 19, 19, gosh, 1999, oh my lord, it was 1919. They only had four members. That's hard to say, 1919. Alpha's first high school was constructed in 1908 and 1909 for $13,000. It became the village grade school after the township's eight districts were consolidated in 1919. <laughs> <laughs> and when the consolidated high school was built in 1924. This is the building which was recently torn down. In 1923, 10 one-room schools in Oxford Township were abandoned and all the country kids began going to town school in Alpha. The kids had to be picked up in horse-drawn buses. Later, I think the bodies from the horse-drawn buses were put on Model T chassis. We've had a fight about this chassis or chassis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In 1955, Dean Robb came to Alpha as a coach. Not 35. 35, yes, 35, because I taught under Dean Robb. In 1935, Dean Robb came to Alpha as a coach and history teacher. And in 1937, he became superintendent. From the time Robb took over in September 35 until December 30th, 1938, Alpha's basketball teams had won 82 games and lost only 13. The 1939 basketball team included Willie Max Plunkett. <laughs> Dean Kelly, John Andrews, Ward Camp, Casanoli, and Harold Bodine. We have two guys. Only by two quarters. <laughs> in 1938, six man football became a reality. Dean Robb was going to quit as coach because there was a problem of where to find the money for suits for the football players. Imagine that happening today. <laughs> the Corn Belt Conference was formed. In April the 12th, 1941, the Alpha Gray School building burned. Do you remember that night? I missed it. I was a freshman. The loss was in excess of $50,000. Children had classes in churches and makeshift classrooms. Now, since there wasn't much school left, it really wasn't too big a hardship. In February 1942, open house at the new grade school was held. The new building was financed through a bond issue of $35,000 and insurance payments on the old building in the amount of $36,000. <laughs> Now, Leo, this is just a bit of trivia, but it wasn't trivial, trivial at the time. But you remember that women teachers could not be married. We had to run to Chicago and get married. And promise we'd put the paper. <laughs> it was only in 1942 
when there was potentially a shortage of male teachers because of the war, that the rule was abolished. So the term old maid school teacher was indeed appropriate. <laughs> the 1942 football letterman team, Merlin Johnson, Earl Anderson, Anson Wilson, Curtis Briggs, Don Manneke, Asa McFarland, Rollin Anderson, Gene Willing, Richard Plunkett, Clyde Livingston, John Clunt, Dale Spore, and me, the arrangement. Well, Clyde is here tonight. Jim Bugas, Richard Rutledge, and Dale Spore. There's Jimmy. The man managers were Lloyd Buckquist and Donald Neely, and the cheerleaders were, get this, June Pawnee, Rick Castanoli, and Pauline Soderberg. Here's June and Rick. Chair. <laughs> in 1943, Noel Mosier was the superintendent and coach. Alpha's team were the Cornbell Conference champions. You should have been proud for that. You were on that team, Leo. That's a football team, incidentally. You, John Clunt, Neil Johnson, Jim Bugas, Kenny and Roy Barton. Come on out, guys. Russell Roach, Gene Gould. Jamie Anderson, Clyde Livingston, Dick Rutledge, Bob Spore, Leonard Plunkett, Jim Forsyth, Joe Raisbeck, and Johnny Hamilton. Probably the wildest basketball game Alf ever played was in 1945 when we played Woodhall. Put all have won 14 straight games, but Alpha defeated them 28 to 22. The score at the end of the first quarter was 7 to 2. And at the half, it was 8 to 4. At the third quarter, it was 21 to 13. Alpha had 12 personal fouls and Woodhall had 6 feet. Good rep. <laughs> I read the paper, so I know it's true. There were 600 fans crowded into the Alpha Gym, and what saved that balcony, I'll never know. <laughs> and another 200 listened to the public address system broadcast of the game in the nearby grade school. Six state highway patrol directed traffic on Route 150. <laughs> Sounds like a smaller version of the United Center. <laughs> In 1948, under the guidance of the Citizens Committee, the Alpha Community District 225 was formed. The new board of directors elected consisted of a representative from each of the seven townships which formed the district. Mr. Elmer Fisher was the first unit superintendent in the Alpha District. We welcome you. This past year, you see the demolition of the 
off the high school building and with it 73 years of memories. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars, but then Hitler came to power and all of Europe was threatened. A Slovenia rose to power in Italy. Now the U.S. is noted for aiding its allies, and Alpha and Oxford Township sent many of its men to serve their country. In June 1941, Wayne France was the first name to be drawn in the second national draft lottery from the list of the Henry County Draft Board number one. The account given in the paper noted that he was formerly a basketball player from Alpha, having played with the 1938 team, and was regarded as one of the most outstanding players ever developed in Alpha. B.S. is my brother. <laughs> was the first draftee from Alpha in World War II. The Lord Memorial, in honor of the men and women of Oxford Township who served in World War II, was dedicated in 1952. There were 143 names on the monument, five stars denoting those killed in the war. Those five stars are for Al Castanoli, who was killed in action near Rome, Italy, May 12, 1944. Bill Timberlake, killed while serving with General Patton's Third Army in France. Walter O'Connor, Leo Rice, and Laverne Lundquist, a navigator on a B-17 fortress, was shot down October 5, 1944. And then we had three Alpha men who were taken prisoners by the Germans. Dick Fluckett, Tom Mahalovich, and Huck Oakberg. Dick was taken prisoner while fighting the Battle of the Bulge and was freed at the end of the war. Tom Mahalovich was a pilot of a B-17 bomber. And one day scared the daylights out of Alpha people when he flew low over town. <laughs> Probably some thought the enemy was about to bomb us. He was a co-pilot on a B-17 when the plane was disabled by German flak. The pilot reported all nine crew members parachuted to safety, but were taken prisoner by the Germans. Tom was in stalag left number one, and the Russians liberated that camp June 1945. Tom's son, Tom, is carrying his father's Air Force uniform. Huck Oakberg, a schoolmate of mine, was a tail winner on a bomber. He was reported missing while flying over Germany July 30th, 1943. He was sent to Stalag 17 near Vienna, Austria. In July, his sister received a letter from him written on February 23rd, stating he had just received his first package from home. She had sent the package to him in September. He was liberated at the end of the war. Leo, do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? That was the day President Roosevelt said we'd live in infamy when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I sure do. I was home listening to Shadow on the radio. <laughs> what were you doing? Well, do you remember some Sunday afternoon when the news came over the radio? I was at Frank Irwin's house. Remember, he was a science teacher at Alpha High School. We all asked, where's Pearl Harbor? But it didn't take long to learn where. It was at that point we all realized that war was really here. The 1A boys had to be ready, and many volunteered. Leo, I don't think a lot of young people realize that our men were scattered all over the globe. The European theater from Ang England, France, Belgium, Italy, Africa, the CBI theater, China, Burma, India, and the South Pacific, all those islands. Wasn't it remarkable that the U.S. won the war on all the fronts? We owe so much to our servicemen and women. You were in the Navy, Leo. Yep. These are representatives of those who served their country in World War II. Joe Boobin, the Army. Max Sutrell. Max Sutrell, the Marines. 
I thought the Marines were always on time. <laughs> The Naval Air Force.
to encourage the public to become volunteers. Alpha is one of the many small towns which survives through volunteerism. People volunteer at their churches, at school programs. People volunteer at the bridge program. They volunteer every week after school to tutor youngsters who need help. The Meals on Wheels program. The Food Pantry. People have volunteered to put on these Crosby Centennial activities. <laughs> the Lions Club, the American Legion, an auxiliary, the JCs. Every organization functions because of its volunteers. Alpha is very fortunate to have two volunteer groups that are vital to our property and to our lives. We have our emergency medical technicians, the EMTs, unless they've been called out. <laughs> Shall we German? Dean Peterson, Chris Peterson, Rob Dean.
13 years later, June of 1912, Louisa Panovich and Vensel Mihaljevic were married in Canton, Illinois. Wearing her great-grandmother's dress is Thais Ansu, daughter of Reggie Ansu and Tina Ansu. Her dress is gray in color with inserts of lace on the sleeves and collar. Margaret Elliott became Mrs. Howard McCurdy on Christmas Day in 1930. Margaret's granddaughter, Carrie McCurdy, daughter of Brent and Sally, is wearing Margaret's wedding suit of brown crepe. <laughs> Margaret carried pink roses. They were married at St. Mark's English Lutheran Church in Davenport, Iowa. At the time of their marriage, Margaret worked at Northwestern Bell Telephone Company, and Howard was with Western Electric Company. Geraldine Hendrickson and Joe Bubin were married January 9, 1944, at the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Swedona, Illinois. At the time of their marriage, Joe was on furlough from the Army, and Jerry was teaching at Maple Valley, which was a, a one-room school located between Woodhall and Andover. Jerry is wearing her original wedding dress, veil, and shoes, and she was willing to give us the cost of her wedding clothes. The dress was $20.35, the veil $15.30, and her shoes were $2.58 for a grand total of $38.23. was a mere $1,000 with without taxes and pension taken out. On December 2nd, 1951, Alice Cole and Jean Walene were married in the former United Methodist Church here in Alpha. Alice says it was a lovely spring-like day for December. Britta Waters, daughter of Marvin and Ann Waters, is wearing Alice's dress. Britta is a junior at Western Illinois University. After a short wedding trip to Chicago, where they saw Tony Bennett perform, Gene reported to San Antonio, Texas, as he was serving in the Air Force. And Gene and Alice have lived in their present residence for 39 years. <laughs> Melba Baird and Basil Jordan were also married in the former United Methodist Church at 3 o'clock p.m. on May 17, 1953. Their daughter, Randy Creedon, is wearing her own wedding dress, which she wore when she married Patrick Creedon on October 2nd, 1982, at the present Methodist Church. Randy's dress is a three-piece ensemble of white taffeta and chiffon knit. The veil of Venetian lace is accented with pearls and sequins. Randy is carrying her mother's wedding gown, which was ballerina length of white nylon tulle over satin. on June 14, 1964. They're celebrating their 33rd wedding anniversary this very day. Karen Grabowski, daughter of Don and Marjorie Patterson, and wife of Robert Grabowski, is wearing Gloria's dress. Gloria is proud that her mother, Jean, made her dress and tells us that the, that the sheet of satin laid on her living room floor for nearly a week before her mother could make the first cut. The dress is princess floor length with handmade bows. The sewing machine Jean used was a Singer Truttle. Gloria was the first lady of Alpha for 16 years while Rod, her husband, served as our mayor. Sandy Lindsay, daughter of Jerry and Audrey Lindsay, married Bob Snyder, son of Dolores Anderson, on April 30th, 1967 at Bethany Lutheran Church in Woodhall. Sandy says her dress doesn't fit quite the way it did on her wedding day, but is glad she can wear it, and she and Bob celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary in April. Sandy is carrying a white Bible that was given to her from the Marina Dale shop, where she purchased her wedding gown and veil. Mark Johnson on May 
May 7, 1977, at St. John's Catholic Church in Woodhall. Vicki is the daughter of Tony and Dolores Petrovich, and Mark is the son of Neil and Jackie Johnson. Their daughter, Ari, is modeling her mother's dress and shoes. Holly Anderson, Vicki's sister, made the wedding gown. We see Carrie McCurdy now modeling her mother's wedding dress. Sally Hintermeister, daughter of Dr. Glenn and Donna Hintermeister, and Brent McCurdy, son of Howard and Margaret McCurdy, were married March 11, 1978, at the Preemption United Methodist Church. Sally tells us she purchased her dress at the South Park Yonkers for $175. Carrie is carrying Sally's original bouquet of silk roses and gardenias. The lawn of Dick and Doris Rutledge was the marriage scene for Lori Luttrell, daughter of Max and Darlene Luttrell, and Greg Nimrick, son of Delbert and Elaine Nimrick, on August 28, 1982. Lindsay Doyle, who will be a senior at Alwood this fall, is wearing Lori's gown. The veil was made from the train of the dress, and Lori carried a lace fan on the day of her wedding. Jody Anderson Curry. Jody is the daughter of Greg and Becky Anderson, and the groom Josh is the son of Duane and Carol Curry. They were married at the United Methodist Church on November 30th, 1996. And so the generations continue. From the beginning to the end of this We have our doctors, people, and animals. We have nurses, we have a pharmacy, we have churches, we have a grocery store, a bank, post office, Tony's Plumbing and Heating, a flower shop, insurance office, video store, a laundromat, Bill's Garage, a gas station, convenience store, lawyers. Our basic needs are cared for here. You can see many generations of people have chosen to live here. The family names, Hawkins, Wirt, Rutledge, Paul, Mahalovich, Padovich, Stevens, Franz. I think the friends and work families have lived here longer than any other. Petrovich, Lubin, and McCurdy, just to name, just to name a few. Descendants of the early settlers remain in Alpha. That fact lends stability to our town. Remember, Anson Coffins heard the minister read from the Bible. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha was the beginning, and it survives. But we are individuals and mortals and must leave this earth. Almost 700 people have chosen to be buried in the Alpha Cemetery. We are so fortunate to have Jean and Alice Wall in to take care of our final rites. Alice was a coal, and Jean's father, Vernon Wall in, was a partner of Peterson and Earl Knox. Again, we have an extension of generating. <coughs> But everybody, please come out on stage. We thank you for coming tonight.
I want to thank some people. Our helpers, Sally, Bree, Anya, Tina, Van Joy, Tanya Mahalovich, Alice Mahalovich, Marilyn Zoom. I don't know who all is back there, frankly, but thanks to all of you. Thanks to Mr. Forward for making us a priority to have the stage painted. Believe me, this is much better for us. <laughs> Thank you to Dick Taylor for the signs. Back there is the key diner sign. Thanks a lot, Dick. Thank you to the men and women who have come backstage. Thank you to all of you who have come on stage, who have come from near and far. Thank you, Mr. Fisher for your years in education and making us proud to be a member of the Alpha and Allen schools. Thank you, Dr. Picard and Dorothy, who were always there when we needed you. And now, Dr. DeHegel, thank you for being here. Thank you to Lorna Bland Van Steckelman for loaning for Iger's scrapbooks. That was an education. And you can't imagine the hours you would spend on reading those old scrapbooks. There are probably names and places of people that we have forgotten inadvertently because you're all important. And uh, Neil, thank you. And I'd like to take a minute and have your attention and give our respect to Jen McKee here who wrote most of the script and spent many long hours holding the loose hands together. Rachel? Francis? I don't know. 
Oh, I didn't know that. We're here now at Alpha Quasicentennial Kitty Parade, waiting for it to start. It's about 10 minutes until it's supposed to start. Lots of people. <laughs> and who's that? Well, hi there. Well, it's my little buddy. Oh my God. <laughs> There's lots of people around here. Although that little kid who just put his hand, her hand in front of the screen, I think is going to get beat up by my opponent. <laughs> oh, and there's a little runt right now. Oh, not now. Oh, the parade has started and they're coming down the road in just a little bit. They'll be touched. But, right now I'm just zooming in on some people here. I'm going to gank all the kids. Who is that? Well, oh, there's Chevy fire trucks coming down with his lights blinking. What's the king? Here comes the truck. I said, I think I have. I have I'm proud to be true. I can ride on the truck. I know my dad. I don't close it well, but you know, it's get involved. Thank you. Oh, it's a fire truck. Kids like the fire truck. You guys know about there. I didn't tell you about that. I said my dad. It's on the fire truck and a bunch of people on top. And look who that is behind us, the Ronald from McDonald's. I just ate a Big Mac. I hope that wasn't from his stomach. <laughs> oh, and there's Mr. Piggy. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Piggy. Throw me some candy. I'm hungry. Didn't eat lunch today. And now, Piggy, you wave at me, I'll whack you in the face. And die. Come on, throw me one. Throw me one, Piggy. Throw me one. I know I'm greedy, but I like it and I love it. And I want some. Hey, hey, Ronald. Look at that. We're on television. Hello there! Hi there! Hi everybody! Ashley! Woo! Look at that small horse back there! And Piggy, hey, take me off! Frisbee! I want a Frisbee! I want a Frisbee! I want the white one! <laughs> oh, I am fat today! <laughs> Piggy! Frisbee! Frisbee, Piggy! Piggy! Here you go, guys! Thank you! Yay. Oh, there's lots of people here. Excuse me, I had a... Hey, my partner's oh, a truck. Hey, look at that little kid. Oh. Not in Kansas. It's in Alpha. I'm going to put all my stuff in my hat. Look at all these little kids he's coming. Who is Where? Who is this? Who's going there? Who's going there? Who's going there? Alpha is the best. Move it out. Yeah, Pete. Mm -hmm. Wow, here's some more little kiddies. Hey, it's a Twinkie movie. <laughs> hey, look at all them. That is a fat Twinkie movie. I saw it. Hey, it's way too It's Brian. Hey, wait! You're on national television! There you go. Brian. 
Hey, Brian! Brian! <laughs> He's not listening. <laughs> Here's some kids. B B thirteen. Seventeen is that? That should be an airplane. Wing long. I got a frisbee. <laughs> yeah, look at the Dalmatian. It's Penzi. Oh, uh, Kaylee, I mean, not Penzi. I like the kitty cat. Oh, that cat. I'm like that. Look at the kitty. Honey, look at the kitty. Hey, the kitty. Thank <laughs> you. 
Shut up! Running out of juice! Man, that's like a 25 cc. More or less a 25 volt. <laughs> that's just a little 25 cc? 25 volt. No, no. Oh. Yeah, Ryan's about right. 25 volt. Yeah. Here comes Johnny, dear. No, it's a 6 volt. Oh, bar me, six foot. He's got his tablet boots on. Yeah. Yeah, it's landing! What are you doing on a tractor? I thought you were banned from driving for life. Landing. I see that. Oh, I should have known I had to do something to school. Hey, 
basketball around here. Hey, 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 let me stay something now. If you don't let me stay something, I'm going to hit you up. Come on, guys. Understand that. No, I don't think he's going to get a chance. I got one piece of skin. I got five. Yeah. Still going. <laughs> oh yeah, I see it. Is it still going? Yeah. <laughs> Gave it the wrong guy because I think I'm in the danger getting hit. Look at us up. I hope 
I'm doing this right. All you guys smile now. I don't do this for a living. Just got the lens cap off. Smile, there you go. Come on, guys, smile. Make it look good. Yeah, sure. And there you go, wave. Smile, guys. Hello, Mr. Rutland. Oh, we got a 
gotta visit the funeral museum. Can't miss that one. Yeah. Everybody have a big smile. Everybody say cheese. Hey, hey, hey. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Smile, guys.
smile. There you go. That's the way you do it. Practice makes perfect. Smile, guys. Wave, guys. Wave. There you go.
Oh. 